Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Anne's Art Adventures. I'm in Kempville today, and I can't wait to introduce you to Meredith Luce. She is a new mom, a graphic artist, an illustrator, and so much more. So let's get started. So Meredith, you are creative in so many ways. What was your first form of creative expression? Um, I would say my first um, creative expression was probably music. Um, when I was growing up, my parents uh, fairly early on put me into piano lessons. Um, I played cello and a few other instruments along the way. Um, but I definitely was into obviously coloring and all of the you know, fine art practices of a three-year-old or four-year-old. Um, so I think music sort of branched into art and then sort of back and forth between the two. Do you remember the first piece you sold and what was it? Uh, I was reflecting on this um, ahead of time and um, when I was growing up we had a, a cottage and I had two neighbors that were similar age to me, two girls, and we would color our coloring books and then have art auctions that our parents would attend <laughs> and we would sell uh, sell our colored masterpieces for five cents or ten cents or something to the highest bidder and uh, and then go to the, the store to buy penny candy back when that was a thing um, and yeah that was certainly you know I think helped me value art going forward even though I was really young it's sort of um, the idea that we priced our pieces even if they were only five cents or 25 cents it was based on how much time you had put into the uh, into the piece of art and um, how intricate the the coloring was and how well you you had uh, um, executed the piece so I think that was probably my my foray into uh, business of fine arts That's so sweet. <laughs> did you always know you were an artist or did you develop your identity over time I think um, oddly enough I don't often refer to myself as an artist even now and it was really through meeting my husband and um, getting introduced to other people by him that uh, he would refer to me as, uh, you know, when his colleagues or friends said, oh, what, you know, your girlfriend, your wife, what does she, um, what does she do? He would just tell them I was an artist because he realized, well, she's a graphic designer, but she's a musician, but she's also an illustrator. Mm -hmm. So that just became uh, for him the most obvious answer. And I still, um, I still find it really, heartwarming to hear him say that because it's you know it took somebody else to help me identify my own um sort of my own place in the world I guess um in that sense because I never had the confidence to maybe call myself an artist even though I was always making art um I certainly referred to myself as a musician because that was something I was doing commercially and um I think I, I felt I had enough official accolades or um sort of financial representation that it was something I was doing successfully enough in the traditional sense that I could call myself that. Whereas with art, I think it's very hard because, um, you know, you don't make paintings. Well, some people make commission paintings, but generally um, you're not, you know, you're making them because you're passionate about doing it and whether or not you're getting financial reimbursement is sort of a afterthought or for many artists after death when you think about some of the famous artists in art history. So he validated you as an artist. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, which, you know, I still, again, it's like to hear him say that, that's like, oh, I guess I, I guess I am an artist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when we worked together on my deck of art therapy cards, you had just released your fifth album. Can you tell us a bit about being a musician and a performer? So I guess that was an interesting time because I had just um, come out of a recovery from a concussion um, and that particular album was sort of my uh, I guess venture back into creative things uh, following that um, that head injury because I certainly at that time I had it had taken me a lot to get back to being able to sing my songs again being able to remember the lyrics to the songs um, and have the stamina to perform and I'd sort of been building up a a bank of of songs that I wanted to record, but I wanted to wait till I had enough to choose from. Sort of like curating an art show where an artist might not put up every single piece that they've they've created in a, in a series. They might sort of pick the strongest ones. Um, so with that record, I really, in some ways it was also my last, I guess my last effort 
in giving myself permission to say, okay, if this works, then I'm going to keep pushing with music and take it more seriously. Um, and if it doesn't work out, then, you know, I've made this album and I'll be happy I've made it. And I'll just retire that as a, um, a more formal endeavor. Uh, and it ended up, I think, being a bit upsetting because I, the, the CD release didn't go as well as I had hoped. Um, there was some confusion in booking the venue and the venue was very expensive. I ended up losing money on the CD release and uh, I really, I think, be partly because of the concussion and partly because of all of the emotional buildup to that, that release of music, um, I really crashed afterwards and, um, you know, experienced, I think, a lot of mental health issues afterwards and felt that it was a time that, you know, I was, I was reworking my identity because I had self-identified more as a musician, uh, for so long. And I felt like I just didn't want to do music any, anymore. I had to sort of redefine who I was. I wasn't, if I wasn't a musician and I didn't really self-identify as an artist at that time, um, it left me sort of scrambling and, uh, yeah, it was, it was a, a really difficult time, but I think I'm so glad I made the record because it certainly felt like something I had wanted to do for myself above all else. Um, and it, I do feel like it was the strongest, um, album that I, I have put out from all the ones I had done to that point. Um, but it's, it's sort of, there's a bit of, I think, grief around that particular art, art endeavor because of the fact that it, um, it didn't live up to my, my own expectations. And as an artist, and I think many artists are like this, you're your own harshest critic. Mm -hmm. And I had very high expectations for, um, even just selling, you know, selling out the CD release, which I didn't do. And, um, I, I had initially just wanted to release it as a, uh, a digital album. And I had a lot of people saying, Oh, you know, you have to make a real CD. Like, you know, don't just do a digital copy. Um, similar to uh, book publishers who, you know, instead of doing an ebook, they say, no, no, like print some real books. It'll be so nice. And I was, oh, okay. Yeah. I'll spend that extra couple thousand dollars to get, um, physical, no physical copies printed. Exactly. And then, um, yeah, now I have, you know, many, many hundreds of copies of the CD in storage. And, uh, so it, you know, I, I think it helped me though, to redefine my goals and boundaries and expectations for other art in my life. Um, in some senses, you know, so I try and, I try and now take something positive out of the experience that, you know, it was fun to do, um, and it fulfilled a few of my goals, but, um, you know, trying to take it as a learning, a learning experience. And, uh, and again, you know, knowing that probably my, my physical and mental health wasn't in top form at the time either. And, and that certainly I'm sure had an impact on how things transpired. I am shocked to hear you say that you don't think of yourself as an artist because I know of so many different forms of art that you're really good at. Um, could you give us an overview of the different art mediums that you work in? Um, well, I, I think part of working in all of these different art mediums is why I don't consider myself an artist in the sense that I'm, um, I like to try lots of things, but I don't consider myself extremely strong at any one particular thing. Um, I think creativity is my forte. So I think I'm a creative person rather than an artist and that um, uh, having creative ideas, creative problem solving, that those are generally my strengths. But um, because of enjoying that creative process, um, I really do try and dabble in as many different mediums as I can. Um, I've done pottery off and on uh, in the last four or five years, which I really enjoy. Um, it's very it's very physical and very tactile, which is different from the, the digital art that I do. Um, you don't have the same sense of time passing when you're working on a computer, I find, as when you're you know sculpting something. Um, painting, uh, <laughs> obviously, as I'm working on today. Uh, which I do find as well as um, fairly physical in that I tend to um, I tend to paint with sort of wet on wet and tend to paint things quickly. Uh, illustration, I certainly love working in pen and ink and I have um, a digital tablet that I use to do a lot of sort of pen-like renderings uh, with a digital pen and tablet, but I still find I really 
I always want to go back to pen and paper because to me that it doesn't, it's not the same experience as working digitally. Um, so I guess there's those silk screening, um, music I've mentioned. Uh, there's probably, I guess, uh, some textile arts as well, crochet. I don't really consider those art pieces per se. They're sort of functional, wearable things that I tend to make um, just for fun, for myself, for family. But um, they are all certainly explorations of different creative mediums. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Which is your favorite medium right now and why? I would say... Um, Paint is definitely one that I'm, uh, I enjoy at this sort of stage in life generally. I've been really exploring acrylic a lot more and I love the sort of the live uh, um, evolution of, of color on the, on the canvas and that when I'm working with wet paint, every time I add a color, there's always risk involved and there's reward when it works out. The risk being, you know, if you're mixing colors that become muddied if you put too much into it, um, so I like that there's kind of a, a living, breathing component of, of the medium. Uh, my favorite thing that I've done recently that was creative was actually a snow sculpture I did outside in the field. I um, that. Yeah, I, I was just, I had had a particularly rough day of mothering and <laughs> I needed an outlet and uh, we had just had a wonderful snowfall. And I thought, you know what, I'd really love to go. It had been on my bucket list sort of for many years now to build some giant snow sculpture that people would see from the road and uh, hopefully it would bring a smile to people's faces or make them wonder, you know, what, <laughs> what this was. She's a new mom. Yes, you know, <laughs> back away. Um, but no, it, it was really fun because it, it was very organic in how it came together. I didn't really have a plan. It was maybe going to be a snowman and I had rolled these boulders so far that they were so big I couldn't lift them. So I thought, well, maybe it's a snowman on its side and it just sort of, sort of as I looked at the shapes, they took form and it was sort of um, sculpting in, in a much larger scale um, because I don't have access to a pottery studio right now. And because it was very physical, um, it really helped get out a lot of adrenaline and mm -hmm. and fill my need for fresh air it was so in that sense I think it was really wonderful because it um it, it you know motherhood there's a lot of multitasking in motherhood and so it was a type of art I could do that really that met a lot of my needs in that moment so um that was really special and I think I, I definitely want to go out and and do a little more finessed uh finishing touches on the sculpture and maybe add some other family members to the creature that I <laughs> that I built out there um but weather weather dependent and nap dependent as seems to be the case with much of my activities in life these days so can you walk us through your process generally I would say um I don't tend to plan things in that much detail um today I've been putting a lot more planning into these pieces, partly because I have such limited time to do art that I can't afford to kind of paint over and redo and redo just until I'm satisfied with something. Um, but generally speaking, I, I get inspired by things that I see um, in a, you know, in my travels or just out the window, um, memories, certain emotions that I have connected to visual memories uh, from my childhood of, of certain scenery. And once that image is in my mind, it kind of gets cataloged for future reference. And then when I have the right shaped canvas or um, the light outside, something about the, the, the sunlight brings me to that place. It sort of pulls that, that image out of the, file, the mental file folder and, uh, um, and I get in, into the mood and the, the headspace to create that piece. So I think a lot of my process has to do with um, being guided by my emotions on a given day um, and the time I have available as well. So if I feel like I need to do something creative, uh, I'll really try and be aware of my uh, my time and, and what I think I can accomplish because I do like to get things done in one shot. That's certainly um, something I've had to alter a bit with my <laughs> changing family situation. But uh, generally, I love if I can do a painting from start to finish, uh, in in one sitting or crochet something and finish it, uh, that's extremely satisfying. So that's a part of my process that I really love. Often though with paintings I'll do, um, I won't necessarily plan on the canvas, but I'll plan little thumbnail sketches 
in my sketchbook and get ideas for sort of how I want to frame things or position things and I'll end up with all of these ideas for other paintings sort of that it takes me away from what my initial project was going to be but then I have again that sort of catalog of things to go back to when I do have time to paint um, paint or draw that uh, I sort of flip back and go oh yeah I really I really wanted to capture this feeling or this this scene and the um, again even if it's a you know I'm not really an abstract painter but um, but I there's feelings that I want to capture within a particular scene because I think you can convey uh, you can convey an image I'm, I'm working on these sort of pasture uh, scenes right now, but there's a, a light and a mood that I want to evoke in them. You know, you could certainly feel like they're very desolate or you could feel that they're very warm and full of life and, and welcoming. So, um, yeah, I guess that's hopefully a somewhat clear, <laughs> coherent <laughs> description of my, my sort of kooky process, but I'd say non, it's a non-process process, maybe. <laughs> yeah. How would you describe your style? Uh, I would say over time it's evolved to have a, a very impressionist flavor to it. Um, I do like to try and get some sort of realism in the, um, the shadows and again trying to capture light and color in a way that, that feels very real. Um, but I think over time I've started to let go of precision and focus more on capturing the, again, the feeling or the essence of the the subject and you know as long as people can look at the piece and know know approximately what it is <laughs> um that that's that's certainly enough for me um and it's interesting because i was teaching a a course last night on intro to illustration and composition and saying you know if, if everyone was a a hyper realist painter or illustrator all of our art would look like photographs and which would make it irrelevant to even make a artistic rendering of the photograph yeah. and it would make art in my mind very boring because everyone's style would be the same so um, I've really tried to embrace the fact that I struggle with certain aspects of realism and just work with that and um, let let the areas that interest me such as color and light really drive uh, drive my style and, and the work that I do I think it's very graphic in the sense that um, you know I, I am a graphic designer and I'm thinking of logo designs and simple shapes and that sort of thing so I think a lot of the time when I'm painting uh, I try and break things down into uh, more of those those straightforward shapes but I do I do like to to break away with more loose brush strokes and things like that that I can't achieve when I'm working in a, a digital medium. What are the central themes you explore through your art? I would say the um, the environment is a big um, a big theme or driving force in a lot of my work, uh, not just sustainability and uh, that sort of thing, but the physical environment, nature, um, agriculture has certainly uh, become a really dominant uh, visual in a lot of my work, and I think. Um, I think originally, you know, in high school when I was doing art, I was very much a social and environmental activist and um, political activist and that sort of thing. And you know, what what really fired me up and that really came through in a lot of the work that I did. I think over time I've given myself permission to not always um, make the most sustainable choices in my art mediums because you can't always, well, you could find super sustainable options for everything if you spent the time and, um, and effort, but I think I have to find a balance between those things. And um, I think that ties in really well with the theme of environment and agriculture is there is always balance. Um, things aren't always perfect. Um, and I think too, nature offers such an interesting subject because there's so much joy and glory in the natural world, but there's also death and loss and, um, devastation even you know looking at a winter landscape it can be it can be incredibly serene and and beautiful and pristine but it can also look like a, a vast nothingness the a lack of life you know the sort of opposite of of things and um, you know if you're just seeing snow and and leafless trees and that sort of thing so I think um, 
as a theme, it really it provides me with a real range of uh, of subject matter, and again, a range of the emotions that I like to capture in my work. Mm -hmm. What have you learned about yourself through your art? I think the biggest thing is that I I don't like to plan. <laughs> um, I like spontaneity. Um, like I said, with my especially with my paintings, you know, I'd like to have a general sense of direction, you know, like going on a road trip and knowing that, okay, I only have so much gas on the tank or, you know, these are my sort of limitations of, of my destination. But, um, but I really like to let things just flow freely. I like to have many things on the go at once. And I think um, it's something I've had trouble accepting, which is allowing some mess in my life. I used to be a very clean, organized person and I find with art, if you don't leave things out to be able to see them, to be able to pick them up um, when you have time and opportunity to come and pick away at them, the time it takes to, to get all of your supplies out and get set up and get started, you know, you just can't um, make a lot of progress if it's not your full-time vocation. So I've really, I've learned to just allow the mess to be there or allow, allow things to be unfinished. Um, allow myself to change my plan as I go, like, or having a, I guess, if I do have a plan that it's a very organic one that can, um, that can grow and evolve as I work. And if I make a mistake, I build it into my piece. Um, that's a wonderful thing with acrylic painting too, is it's very forgiving. If it dries, you can just paint over and the problem was never there. So, um, so I think that's, that's probably one of the, the most important things I've, I've discovered. Were your parents artists? They weren't necessarily artists in a professional sense, but my my mom uh, often drew, and uh, I have a lot of memories of of drawings she did of our cat growing up that I always thought were really, really excellent. And um, my dad always had a passion for photography, and still, you know, pursues it as a hobby and has for decades. Um, it's more my uh, in the generation before that, that uh, I think there's a lot more of sort of artist lore among the family that uh, my my mom's father was a painter and and he drew and, and did all these sorts of things. Uh, but a lot of his work was his way, I think, of processing his time during the Second World War. So I have a lot of paintings that he did, um, some of which are kind of disturbing, not in their subject matter, but there's something about them that just seems very... Um, sad or lonely or um, twisted and uh, so it's been interesting to help me get to know him after his death through seeing some of his work um, and also my my great and great great grandfathers had a photography business in New York City uh, around the turn of the century and uh, there's a, a museum in New York City the Museum of the City of New York, <laughs> very <laughs> original name. Um, but they have a collection of, I think, about 22,000 photographs that the two of them uh, took over their lifetime. Wow. And they really photographed the a lot of the disparity in New York life in around eight, the late 1800s, early 1900s. And they would go into people's homes who lived in absolute poverty and had maybe 10 or 12 people all living in one room. And then they'd also go and visit the homes of theater stars of the time and in their opulent, uh, mm -hmm. you know, visiting rooms with tiger skin rugs and, you know, paintings in every square inch of the walls. And it really, um, I think it's interesting that the photography has sort of carried through many generations because in addition to my dad, there's other cousins and um, uncles and who whatnot who have continued to do photography as hobbies as well in our family in our family so um and there's an activism component too which is yeah i think it was subtle i don't think they you know they were certainly commercial photographers that was how they made their living so they couldn't promote themselves as you know right. wanting to make the rich look sort of over uh overindulged or anything like that but they i think in probably in their free time some of that photography it's not stuff that likely would have been something people would have wanted to purchase at the time but it was i guess something that was important to them observing that in their the work that they did and um yeah it's so it's been interesting in some ways getting to know some of my family members through art that they the art forms that they they did in their lifetime 
Do you have a mentor who inspired you? Well, I think growing up, I was very fortunate that my my parents um, both really appreciated the arts, and over the years, they had collected a lot of uh, a lot of art that we had in the house. Um, they originally came to Canada from the states, and they lived in the Maritimes. And I think because of their time there, they ended up. Um, really falling in love with a lot of the work of uh, people like Alex Colville and um, David Blackwood um, and they own a number of their pieces and so it's I think it's interesting that the art in my house growing up was very graphic a lot of those the sort of printmaking style is very crisp shapes and crisp forms mm -hmm. um, high contrast that sort of thing and uh, you know to now be a someone who does printmaking as well. I guess I didn't mention that in among some of the other art forms that I do, but uh, lino cut printmaking and silkscreen, I guess, um, sort of ties into uh, into that. But um, yeah, I only recently was realizing, looking over some of their those artists' works online, that it really, it's imagery that has stuck with me through my life. And, and I think they're both artists who, um, who also capture a lot of the natural world and um, just sort of outdoor scenes and that sort of thing. So it's interesting that it's maybe just caught up with me, I guess, as, a, as an adult. Mm -hmm. um, but probably um, other, other sources of inspiration would certainly be s some other printmakers. Um, Jay Ryan, who has a company um, in Illinois called The Bird Machine, and he does uh, silkscreen posters. He does some that are sort of just fun illustrative works of his own, but he does a lot of concert poster design um, for bands like Wilco and Andrew Bird, um, Nico Case, I think maybe, but um, uh, his work actually, he's some of the pictures that are up in the house are, um, are some of his prints and uh, yeah, I really, I love his whimsical, whimsical style. I think that's really um, informed some of my, my illustration in the last probably five years or so. You're a mom now. How has motherhood influenced your art and impacted your business? Um, well, definitely my ability to remember things um, and stay focused, I would say, is a, um, a big change uh, since becoming a mother. I certainly have always been distractible because I think I'm a visual person, so I'm often caught up in things I'm seeing. Um, but it really... I think it was the biggest part of motherhood that I wasn't prepared for and that I didn't feel sufficiently warned about by other mothers was how much how much time you spend doing nothing in mm -hmm. the sense of nothing measurable. Yes. Um, I read a wonderful article recently about you know all the things that you are doing even when you feel like you're doing nothing. Mm -hmm. um, bonding with your child and um, building your sort of foundation of your communication with them and all this. but. It really, the the limitations on my time and on, therefore my creativity were really astounding to me. And I find the sleep deprivation has really affected my ability to have complete creative thoughts as well. Um, Any time that I I am free to do some adult thinking and focusing, um, I tend to focus really on my paid my paid design work. And I think in some ways that even though I'm focusing more on my business, it might be hurting my business a little bit because I think the time I spend being creative in a non-commercial way uh, really helps to flex those creativity mm -hmm. muscles and um, keep my mind fresh and keep my ideas flowing. And when the only time I have available is to um, is to do design work for sort of corporate app applications, um, it's just not creative in the same to the same extent that my art is because my art is totally free there's no there's no limitations on the subject matter or um, the way that it's expressed or that sort of thing yes. um, so you know in some ways my business is growing now that I'm a mother because I have to prioritize income um, but it's definitely I think I'm still emotionally processing and adjusting to how little time I have to do the creative things that really fill me up um, mm -hmm. as 
you know, as me, Meredith, not me, mother of my daughter, extension, um, of. extension of, you know, dairy, dairy bar <laughs> to my child. Um, <laughs> so I think, you know, it's something that I'm, I'm almost grieving and I've, I've had a lot of mixed feelings about, um, you know, trying to determine, do I regret becoming a parent? Like what, how do I understand that mm -hmm. feeling? Um, and someone, another mother said to me the other day, it's grief. She said, you're grieving your former self, your sort of free independent self. Um, and the fact that that life is behind you and it's, you know, as your child becomes more independent, um, certainly you will get some of that back, but I think I'm never going to have all of my brain occupied only by my, uh, creative ideas. It's always going to be half or more occupied by thinking about my daughter, her needs, worrying about her, yeah. you know. Um, but I do greatly look forward to when she's old enough to do art with me. That's certainly, oh, that's that was, cool. that was a real, um, you know, assuming she'll even like art, go figure, she'll be like, I hate arts and crafts. Oh, yeah, I can't really Let me go play football, whatever. And uh, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, if she gets into math and science, I will not be able to help her very much. But, uh, but yeah, it's, I think it really is a, uh, it's been very emotional. And I, you know, I'd be curious to know how many other, as you're probably finding out through a lot of these interviews, how many other, um, artists are finding a challenge and again changing your identity um before i was a musician now i've just become comfortable calling myself an artist and now i'm having to re sort of re-identify and reevaluate how i see myself uh once again and um yeah it's been devastatingly hard i mean there's a part of me that is reluctant to be overly candid in a recorded interview but i think um i just wasn't prepared um for how much it would affect me and um it it's i mean it's the most wonderful thing i've ever done in my life i don't think i would ever trade it in knowing and even as an artist i've now experienced a joy beyond any emotional experience i could ever conceive of having had my daughter and some of the moments i have with her and her birth you know i mean it's just it's mind blowing at the, as someone who feels a lot, you know, I'm a yeah. very sensitive person. It really, it was just, it was unbelievable. Um, but at the same time, it's also, um, made me feel some of the deepest grief and sadness that I've ever felt in my life because of that, um, loss of some aspects of my, my identity. And, uh, yeah, it's just a roller coaster. And I think, um, women are getting better about, being more candid with one another about this when mm -hmm. friends say yeah I want to have a baby it's like okay well just so you know <laughs> there it's there's a lot of magic but there, a lot of it is is crazy it's just you, and you can't you can't really describe it to people I think until they're in it themselves like it just is so it's so unique to other feelings um the the joy you feel is different from other joys and the the sorrow is different from other sorrow um, for people who've experienced pregnancy loss or who have lost a child too. I mean, it's, um, it, it really is just such a different category, uh, I think from, from other life experiences. And experience differently from each mom as well. Exactly. And that too has been, I think that's why it's hard for people to, you know, warn one another. And I don't mean that in a nasty sense, but yeah. you know, someone who, um, as someone who's had a miscarriage, you know, I was devastated and it was, it was very early in the pregnancy and to some people, you know, it might be like, well, you know, it was like not even a peanut. So what's the big deal? And then other people who maybe lost a pregnancy at a later stage and didn't feel that upset about it because maybe they had multiple children or, you know, whatever might have informed their emotional state. Um, it really, it really is unique, like you said, to, to every mother. And so in that sense, it's hard to get into someone else's headspace and try and prepare, prepare them from their own perspective of, of how it might impact their own life and their own identity. Being an artist and a business person can be challenging. You have a great business sense. Where did you learn your business skills? I think a lot of my sort of entrepreneurial business sense, uh, I learned 
in high school um, through my music career because I, I really was starting to play professionally from a very early age. I was about, I think, 16 or so uh, when I had my first festival gig and my mom was retired and sort of coaching me along and helping to manage my uh, my music career and I think well between her and my dad who is a uh, union labor negotiator so <laughs> had a good appreciation for valuing you know skills and time and that sort of thing um, they both encouraged me to value what I was doing and um, certainly with music uh, most musicians even ones you see who are winning Junos they're running their own show for the most part um, some of them might have booking agents who book their tours for them, but a lot of the time they're they're running a lot of aspects of the business themselves, and uh, that's essentially the only way to make money in music, I think, um, especially for Canadian independent artists. And uh, I was going to music conferences and networking with other, you know, adult musicians when I was 15, 16, 17, wow. which is so, when I think back to it and I meet 15 year olds now and I think, like, what was I doing? Um, how did I, how did no one, see me as being out of place there um, but it really did give me a huge transferable skill set that I think I wouldn't I wouldn't be running my own uh, design business working for myself now if I didn't have that foundation I think it um, it gave me enough confidence and enough essential knowledge to sort of just stumble into having my own business um, over time which is essentially how I came to run my own business was just taking on projects to the point that I couldn't take a full-time job anywhere because I had enough freelance work. Um, yeah. What would you say to people watching this who feel that they do not have a single creative bone in their body? If you're training for a marathon, um, you know, you'll take time to rebuild your muscles, rebuild your strength. And I think with creativity as well, um, you have to sort of relearn habits and retrain your, your brain physically and chemically and whatnot to um, follow the processes that it would have naturally, really, when you were a child. So um, it's almost like a skill that people unlearn. So if you think you don't have the ability to be creative, think of it that you do, you've just, um, you've lost touch with that ability. Um, I It makes me quite upset really when when people tell me that they had art teachers who shut them down because they weren't a good enough artist to do what they were trying to do or you know it didn't look real enough and they shouldn't you know they should pick a different activity to do I think it's so important for people to practice creativity it doesn't have to be art um, you know you can do it in you could be a writer you could be creative even if you're running a business and um, finding new and interesting ways to um, supply your clients with products and that sort of thing. It really is a skill that I think applies across um, a lot of different parts of our lives and uh, I really hope people will reconsider their feelings you know of their own limitations because um, the potentials there in in all of us it just just takes practice to get back to it. What is Stitch and Bitch? So Stitch and Bitch uh, it's not something that I invented it's um, it's a I think people call, there's a knit and natter group in Kempville, um, but I know there's um, stitch and bitch type um, gatherings around the world. And it's essentially an opportunity for women in particular to get together and um, unwind, talk, um, and do fiber arts together. And um, whether it's knitting or crochet, sewing. Um, and I think what's interesting is it, it's something that, again, sort of like creativity was an innate part of our lives. Uh, historically, women would have, um, not that I think it's natural for women to be like pushed <laughs> into like going and doing home, home act projects, but, um, but traditionally women would have um, done embroidery, they would have been making clothes, repairing clothing, um, you know, back to the Middle Ages and maybe perhaps you know, I, I am not a history buff to know all the, the details of it, but I think um, a lot of women's day-to-day -day life involved sitting around with other women working on those types of projects, and it was their opportunity to express themselves more freely, to pass knowledge verbally from one to the next, and I think um, I created a, a little bit selfishly because I had just moved out to um, the North Grenville area, and I didn't have a lot of female friends out here, and I hadn't really had a lot of female friends 
ever having, you know, been in music and mostly surrounded by men and, um, cause the music industry tends to be a bit more, um, male dominated. Um, and I thought this would be a great way to, to bring some strangers together to get to know each other and maybe build a new community. So as I ran into people, uh, in my various activities, I would find out that they knit or they crocheted or they wanted to learn. So I said, oh, why don't you, you know, we'll get together whatever night of the week at so-and-so's house. And um, it sort of evolved to the point that now it's this incredibly emotionally close, close group of, of women. And most almost all of us are mothers at different stages of motherhood. And it's become an opportunity to get together too and really um, vent and brainstorm and um, support each other through some really difficult times as well as really joyful times so it's I think it's amazing how uh, different creative mediums can bring people together um, not just to make uh, physical pieces of art but also to uh, to build community and to build identity for each other in the same way my husband helped me identify as an artist I think um, the friendships that have evolved in our group we've really helped to support each other in our um, our business choices our family choices our careers uh, it's really been something that I don't know how I would have managed through some of the harder times I've had without that, that particular community of women. I know your business is changing and growing quite a bit right now. Is there anything you would like to promote? Right now, one of my, my new directions with my business is uh, a series of workshops called Art Jam, Creative Workshops. And Right now, I'm I'm sort of running a pilot series uh, at the North Grenville Public Library, where um, I'm offering one-off single-day or you know evening evening workshops on different themes, uh, and I'm hoping that it will grow into something that's ongoing and provides an atmosphere for people to come in and feel um, nurtured and relaxed and have the chance to try different types of art that they were maybe nervous to try or they you know didn't want to invest in the materials and just want to come and get their feet wet and see what they think um, so certainly uh, if anyone is looking to learn and explore in, in different mediums they should check that out um, they can visit it through my website looseends.com and there's a link to the Art Jam schedule and there's uh, a calendar for online registration and hopefully it'll also like Stitch and Bitch maybe it will um, connect some people who might not have met in the community and and bring together some like-minded uh, folks so yeah 